Good morning. Welcome to another one of our webinars. It's James from Community Legal Centres Queensland. Um, I'll again for the recording acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we're meeting electronically through the miracles of modern technology um, and acknowledge that we all work on land of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, before I hand over to Lachlan and Kat to talk about the important area of debt vultures, uh, which is absolutely a, um, a, a rising issue for clients of community legal centres and um, financial counsellors and others. A um, couple of housekeeping things. We've emailed through in the last 10 minutes or so uh, a copy of the PowerPoint slides and case studies, but you should also be able to access them on the handout section of the GoToWebinar control panel. If you've got questions, maybe hold them over till the end because webinars aren't great for taking questions. Um, if you've got an urgent one, feel free to, to get involved. There's a couple of ways that you can ask questions. Type them into the questions box on the control panel or otherwise press that button that looks like a hand. We'll see your hand go up. We'll be able to unmute your microphone and you'll be able to ask a question that way. Uh, hope technology willing, we hope to have a recording of this webinar available for you. Uh, and otherwise, I will pass over to Lachlan Edwards and Kat Newton from Consumer Action Law Centre to tell us all about debt vultures, how to respond to them in our casework, and the important reforms that need to be made to make sure that people get the protections that they need. Kat, Lachlan, over to you. Thanks, James. Thanks, James. Office well, here at Consumer action. One of the campaigns that I'm working on at the moment is a push to get this debt vultures industry regulated. Um, my colleague Lachlan is a solicitor working in our legal group, debt vultures. Right. Oh, so as James says, if you've got any questions, anything urgent, please feel free to ask a question during questions at the end and we'll um, endeavour to allow enough time to respond to any questions at the end. All right, so a couple of learning outcomes for today. These are the three things we're going to try and tackle in this hour. Firstly, how you can spot a debt vulture. Secondly, how you can help your clients if they've been affected by a debt vulture. And thirdly, um, how you can advocate for much needed change in this area. Uh, this is a sort of a breakdown of the session. We'll start off by talking about the different kinds of business models that we find in um, find with debt vultures. We'll work through some case studies, firstly one on credit repair, secondly on debt negotiation, and thirdly, time permitting, one on debt agreements. And thirdly, we'll, um, or at the end, we'll talk a little bit about how you can get involved in our campaign. All right, debt vultures, who are they? What are they doing? You might have seen some advertisements on TV or on radio or online spruiking messages like this. Bad credit, money worries keeping you up at night, we can help. Um, but these are the kind of mantras of the debt management industry, um, which is a growing problem in Australia. As we're aware, a lot of people are really struggling with money and financial problems, things like paying bills, making ends meet, and also increasingly the overuse of credit products. So we know that in Australia, access to credit is a really important thing for most of society now. Um, people taking on large amounts of debt means that at some point when circumstances change, managing that debt can become a real difficulty for a lot of people in a very stressful situation. Um, there is help for people, of course, and there are some options to work through problems with unmanageable debt. Um, however, debt vultures are companies that really target people in financial difficulty and sell them services or products that won't actually help get them out of that financial difficulty and in some cases can actually make their problems a whole lot worse. So who are we talking about when we talk about debt vultures? Debt vultures are also known as debt management firms or um, for-profit financial difficulty businesses. We call them debt vultures here at Consumer Action because um, we see them preying on people in financial difficulty. They sell services that cost a lot, often have little or no value to the client 
and in some cases are entirely inappropriate to help them out of their debt problem. Some of the business models include credit repair, or so-called credit repair, debt negotiation, uh, debt agreements, personal budgeting services, and other ancillary services that are targeted at money or debt problems. So this can be things like charging someone to go bankrupt when they're able to do it for free online or with the assistance of a financial counsellor. Also things like buy more time agreements where uh, company 60 days debt relief and all they do is whack it into an ombudsman scheme. And also, um, so what are the problems um, with the debt management industry and debt vultures? There's a, there are a bunch of concerns that we have about this industry. Um, I think probably the main problem is that they're often giving out really bad advice. They're giving out that advice to people who are feeling a pinch. We know from behavioural economics that people in financial stress are less able to make good choices for their financial, um, with their financial problems. So it's really concerning that at a time when someone's maybe got less capacity to make a fully informed decision about their options, they're being sold um, really unsuitable options by companies that have a, a profit motive. So we see unsuitable debt options. We see people coming through our doors that have been sold a product or service without really understanding the consequences of choosing that option over another. A lot of that is likely because many of these businesses have a very poor understanding of the relevant law in the first place. And we see conflicted advice, so circumstances where People have been advised to take one option, which might be in the financial interest of the debt vulture, but not in the interest of their client. Second main category of concern is around fees. The fees are very opaque. It's often very hard to understand how much their services are going to cost you. They, their marketing will often involve a promise of a free consultation or one simple easy payment of $20 a fortnight. But the reality of how much it's actually going to cost you in the long term or over the life of the product or service can be very different. Fees are often charged upfront before any services are actually provided, uh, which can be a problem if the services turn out to be of little value to you and you want to get a refund. Another reason why that's a problem is because none of these companies are required to be a member of the free ombudsman schemes that exist. So in the financial sector, we have the Financial Ombudsman Service and we have the Credit and Investment Ombudsman. They are both um, really great processes for people to go through if they want to bring a free complaint against um, a, a financial firm. However, none of the debt management firms are required to be members of these schemes. So if you have a complaint and you want to get a refund, you've got to uh, trudge off to court at the moment in most cases. We also see high pressure sales tactics, uh, people signing up over the phone. This debt vultures rarely refer to the free options that are available to clients. So if somebody has a, a, a problem with debt or money or their credit worthiness, they can call up the National Debt Helpline for free and hello to any financial counsellors on the session um, and go through those options with a qualified professional. Uh, if there's a problem with a particular contract that they've signed up to. There are community lawyers around who can help with that too, um, who can also assist clients who are struggling to pay bills and really don't need to be paying for help to get out of that situation. And of course, there are ombudsman schemes where you can take a dispute um, if you can't resolve it with the trader. However, many of the clients we see aren't made aren't, aren't aware that there is um, options exist for resolving their problems or bucket load of money. And the main problem, from, uh, from my perspective, in the policy work, is that we have a really poor regulation of higher industry. So at the moment, there's no, that's really a bit of a gap when we consider that there are, you know, quite detailed frameworks for other types of financial products and services in Australia. So that's something we're trying to change. Well, our friends at the National Debt Helpline, a qualified financial counsellor can be a really good starting point. 
for anybody that um, needs some advice on their options to deal with unmanageable debt or credit worthiness. Overview of some of the different business models within the debt vultures industry. Firstly, credit repair. So what does credit repair promise to do? They'll tell you that they'll fix your credit report. People, uh, and um, due to a late payment, then people can be concerned about the impact that that default listing will have on their ability to get a loan down the track. Um, sometimes when people are knocked back for credit, um, they'll jump online and, and try and work out how to clean up their credit report. And they'll see a bunch of ads from credit repair agencies that will make often misleading promises about what they can do for you. So they'll promise to fix your credit report or clean it or wash away defaults and all these sorts of things. However, the credit reporting, there's, there's significant, um, sorry, there are a lot of rules around credit reports and what can be listed and how. If there's an inaccurate listing, then there is a way to get that listing taken down. And there's a free process a person can go through to get um, their credit report fixed. But if the default's been validly listed, then for at least not without some slightly unsavory tactics, to actually take those defaults off your credit report is quite limited in some circumstances. And they, a lot of clients we see are misled about what the credit repair agency will actually be able to do for them. So they're making misleading promises about what they can achieve. Even where they can do something for you, they're charging you a lot of money to do it. So it can be really high upfront fees. There can often be hidden fees, what are sometimes known as success fees, if they do take a default down. So it can be an extra thousand dollars for every default that's removed. And if you have a complaint about the agreement that you've signed up to with the credit repair agency, then in many cases there's limited options to take that to an ombudsman scheme at the moment because there's no requirement for a credit repair agency to be a member. Some are, but they're not required to be. Um, as, um, I know we're going to be moving through these different models at um, quite a, a pace today, so if you have any questions as we go through or um, it's not really making any sense, feel free to flick us through a question and we'll try and respond to that as we go. Okay, next business model, debt negotiation. So what do they do? They promise to settle your, uh, come to a settlement with your creditors of any amount that you owe them and they'll take a cut of what they save you typically or charge you a fee for that process of negotiation. Um, what's the concern with this? Well, well, debt negotiators are entirely unregulated and just about anyone can set up to be a debt negotiator tomorrow. If I get the sack here and decide to make my start in a new industry tomorrow with no qualifications and no requirement to have any understanding about debt options or debt relief or any of these um, pro start negotiating on someone's behalf with their creditors, really no barriers to entry <laughs> into debt negotiation. We see some really bad advice being given out by debt negotiators negotiators. So they can, we see examples of them suggesting really high risk strategies. So they might say, stop paying your creditors now, that will increase our bargaining price about from stopping to pay your debt on your credit for your house. Um, so these are the kinds of strategies where you really want to have a qualified professional giving you advice about the pros and the cons and about the risks. Um, before you decide to go down that path. Uh, we also see very high fees with debt negotiators. Uh, they get, often will give advice without looking at your overall financial situation. Or for example, they might negotiate a debt with one creditor, but not with any of the others. So you work out, you sort out one of your debts, but if you can't pay the remaining debts, you're not in much better of a position. Debt agreement brokers. Debt agreements are a bit of a confusing area, but they're growing. Debt agreements are a form or an option for dealing with insolvency. So when you can't um, pay your debts as and when they fall due. And debt agreements are on the rise in Australia. They're actually now more common than bankruptcy. And they're being heavily marketed by companies that stand to make a lot of money in high fees. So typically for a debt agreement, you'll end up paying a couple of grand for the broker or administrator to do up the paperwork. 
And then every repayment that you pay un under your debt agreement, your administrator will take in excess of 20% of that payment. The idea is with the debt agreement is that you come to a negotiation with your creditors where you pay less of your debt and you make repayments over a number of years. And at the end, if you, if you meet the terms of that agreement, the rest of the debt is waived and the interest will have stopped during that process. However, there's a, a lot of problems around the way these agreements are sold to people. Often they're <coughs> suggested as the best or the only option. And you can see why they sound attractive to people. Uh, but they have significant consequences and these are rarely understood by people who've had a debt vault to help them into one. So it's actually an act of bankruptcy to enter a debt agreement. And that means if your debt agreement falls over or isn't accepted by your creditors, your creditor can move to bankrupt you because you've um, submitted this form. There's also non-refundable and hidden fees. There's very limited regulation of debt agreement administrators at the moment and absolutely no regulation of the brokers. Um, and there's no dispute resolution. So if you have a problem with your broker or with your administrator, it's very difficult to make any kind of complaint about that. And lastly, budgeting and money management. So this is a model where for people who are struggling to make ends meet, or struggling to manage their budget, they redirect their income, be it Centrelink or from work, into their budgeting services account and your budgeting service then pays your bills and your debts for you. Uh, the problem with this is that it can be very expensive. So there's upfront fees and ongoing fees and typically the company will pay themselves, pay their own fees before they pay any of your bills. You see examples where they've set up a really unsuitable budget that was always going to fall over which puts you at risk of, um, of falling into default with your creditors. Um, they don't take any responsibility if that happens and again they're not required to be a member of an ombudsman scheme and there's no um, qualifications or licensing that's required to start up as a budgeting or money manager. All right over to you Locke, we're going to work through some case studies on some of these industries now. Thanks Kat, you're too kind and um, I'm Lachlan, one of the lawyers here, probably the best lawyer here actually. <laughs> And um, Kat has, is a policy officer here, almost the best policy officer here, has, <laughs> uh, has given us a really high level overview. Um, so now that you're all experts in debt vultures, um, what we're going to do is actually talk through some real case examples of what these companies do and how they take advantage of um, everyday people uh, and talk about how the law can help them. So we'll spend a bit of time doing this. And toward the end, um, and even after the uh, uh, webinar today, we'll send out some resources which include uh, sample letters and um, more detailed informational fact sheets about, uh, about um, what your clients can do in these circumstances. So um, if I could paraphrase this one for your benefit, um, essentially we have two people who want to buy their home uh, and can't actually get a mortgage from a bank because it's been, an application's been refused. And so Mick, one of the, your clients, recognises or remembers that he has something about bad credit on his credit file. And when he searches credit report on the internet, it takes him to a company called Credit Miracle. And um, he decides to give them a call and Credit Miracle Miracle say that they should be able to fix his credit report. They say they'll need to check. They get back to him an hour later and fantastic, they can help. If he just pays $1,000 today, they can clear up his credit report and help him on the way to buying a home. They send him some terms and conditions and read them to him and give his credit card details. So the first thing I'll, I'll say about that before we really dissect the second slide um, is does it sound too good to be true? Probably. Um, there's a fundamental problem here with what is being promised and to really understand that goes beyond the scope of this uh, webinar but to understand it would require a thorough um, knowledge of, of the privacy laws and the and credit reporting regime. Um, I think for your purpose what you want to do is do some issue spotting and understand that these are the circumstances in which debt vultures can take advantage of people. So if we move to the next slide, um, 
Mick has signed up for this credit repair agreement with Credit Miracle and a few weeks later they send him a bundle of documents which includes a request to get his credit report and a guide to challenging listings. And so for those unaware, we would say something that's on your credit report is a listing. Most of our clients probably like Mick would say that they've got bad credit. Um, a credit report contains a number of things that could be bad or adverse. Um, so Mick's credit report shows a default listing, which is an overdue account, um, for 480 bucks. And he talks to Credit Miracle, who tell him to go to the telecommunications ombudsman, a free service. Um, Mick rightly wonders why he's paid a thousand bucks to do all the work. And even though Credit Miracle said they'd be able to help him, uh, the ombudsman has found that the credit listing was validly made and it stays on his credit report. He, Mick asked for a refund, but he doesn't get one. Surprise, surprise. Um, this is an extremely common scenario uh, that our people, everyday people will call our legal service about and you may come across. <clears throat> so if we look at the first question, what problems do, do you see with Credit Miracle's conduct? Um, Kat, I'm going to throw over to you. Um, on, on top of that, what's one of the, the problems that you see with what they've done here? Well, he's called up because he wants to get a bad listing off his credit file so that he can get a loan. And they haven't even and they seen have, his credit file. And they don't even know if they can help. I think yeah. worse still, they kind of suggest that maybe they can help because mm. they call back and say that they can. It makes it sound like they've actually gone away and done mm. something. But mm. um, in this case, it looks like they haven't actually gotten a copy of his credit report. So that sales rep really wasn't in any position to be suggesting implicitly and explicitly mm. that they could actually do what Mick wanted. Yeah. So what would that mean, I guess, legally for, for Mick there? Do you uh, have any well, kind look, of claim about that kind of conduct? Oh, look, I, as his learned lawyer, would <laughs> certainly think that Mick has a legal claim here that he could pursue. Uh, he might suggest that the comment that they could help was misleading or deceptive or, or false. Um, we'd probably want to know a little bit more about the, the entire circumstances around that to, to get some more particular detail of it. Um, what, about the, what about the fact that they took ages and then just sent him a bundle of documents? Mm. Um, look, perhaps that's unconscionable conduct. So as most of the lawyers in, in the room on the webinar would understand that, that's really abhorrent or unethical conduct under the Australian consumer law. Probably what really smacks me about this one is that he's called them and explained to them exactly what he wants. They haven't actually been able to provide it and they're hiding behind a bunch of terms and conditions to limit their responsibility here. So the Australian consumer law provides him rights uh, called the consumer guarantees. They're like uh, a, a warranty basically where he has a legal guarantee that the services Credit Miracle will provide to him will be fit for his purpose, so the purpose he says. So this, this service for a thousand bucks should be fit for his purpose to get his credit report fixed. They haven't actually been able to meet that, so that in my view is an actionable legal claim he has. Um, another guarantee that might apply here um, is to provide Credit Miracle to provide its services with due care and skill. So you think back um, for the lawyers in the room to law school, it's kind of akin to the concept of negligence, um, doing your job with the right amount of care and having the skill to actually do it. Um, those are his, his, his legal claims, which what we would suggest if you come across a company like this is to jump on an ombudsman scheme website. So here we'd normally have the credit ombudsman or the financial ombudsman service um, and search for the name of this um, company to see whether they're a member of the scheme and that allows you to make a free complaint um, or it would allow Mick to make a free complaint um, and so, seek a refund. So look, some, some of these companies um, like Credit Miracle might have to have a licence because they provide some other kinds of services and you might have to have a credit licence. And so if they've got a credit licence, they've got to be a member of an ombudsman scheme. In. 
So some would be a member of an ombudsman scheme, but either or not your particular credit repair company is a member of the, the relevant schemes. And so Kat, you used to be a lawyer. What happens if you can't go to an ombudsman scheme? What are some options? I mean, the first step would really be speak to them, point out all the breaches of the relevant law, mm. note that your client's got a, a great, a cracking claim against them and see if you can negotiate that refund. Failing that, um, you should be able to take these kinds of issues to the local state-based civil trial. Another thing you might want to consider doing is putting the regulator on notice of the ACCC, state-based consumer affairs regulator, having the harm that these companies cause to people who are um, and, 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 and making the case that there needs to be some better regulation. Thanks, Kat. That was a fantastic. Just summary. putting my two cents in there yeah, too. <laughs> you should not let your practicing certificate lapse. No, I won't. Uh, we're going to move on to debt negotiators, and so commonly in our, our experience with our clients and everyday people is they will fall behind on money they owe, or some. Someone come, some debt collector suggests that they owe money, and uh, like in this case, um, or they'll Google, you know, consolidating debts or some offer that situation. So a really classic and um, and eventually the bank takes legal action to. enforce the loan and, and get out here, certainly in Victoria, uh, of these companies, so flyers, um, which they'll, Alan and Anna will receive in the mail, saying we can help you refinance or we can help you stop your home being repossessed, we can stop you from bankruptcy, you need to act now, it's urgent. Um, creating a sense of real urgency, um, um, Alan and Anna. And certainly they're right, there is some urgency in this case. Um, so Home Saver come in and uh, offer to help refinance. This one's factually dense and I'll, I'll try. Alan and Anna are told that they need to urgently speak to another company uh, called Helpers. Home Saver suggests that Helpers can buy more time for them to arrange the refinance. Um, so then they go to Helpers um, who our lawyers, we suggest, um, and they say, well, we can get you 60 more days to buy time to stop the repossession, and that'll give home savers more, uh, more chance of getting the, the debt consolidation or the refinance on your home loan. Um, the contract's not explained to them. It's a fee of $4,000 and um, help us lodge a caveat on the title of their property. So for the non-lawyers, a caveat is basically a notice on the title, which prevents you from um, any more dealings or selling of the property um, until the caveat's been dealt with. So it's either been removed or the person who um, has the claim um, gets title. Uh, so without telling Anna and Anna to halt the repossession, help us simply make a complaint to an ombudsman service, which as we've talked about before, um, is a free service. So helpers don't talk to them about this um, at all. And Alan and Anna, hear nothing from home savers and contact them uh, until they contact them and say they need to sign two more agreements. One to clean their credit report, which we've heard about before, and one to negotiate their unsecured debts. Um, hearing nothing from home savers for some time, Alan and Anna surprisingly receive a notice to leave their home from the sheriff. Really concerned, um, they find a way to save their home, but they receive a bill for $12,000 from helpers. So I think we can smell a rat here, Kat. Mm. What do you think about that? It's pretty shocking conduct, isn't it? So they've asked for some help. They needed some help. That was clear. They went to a company who said they can help. And it doesn't seem like they've actually gotten much help for their $12,000 bill. 
and cave in on their property. Yeah, absolutely. And so, um, what what issues do we see? Um, mm. We see promises that are made um, that necessarily aren't kept. Um, perhaps other than helpers who they've really done what they said they've done, but they've provided something that these Alan and Anna could have done for free for four thousand um, so, dollars. So explain that. So with the buy more time. Mm. The sixty days. How did how did they buy more time for? Well, Anna probably and need a little bit case. more detail in the case study, but um, what they did was they made a complaint to an ombudsman service, which Alan and Anna could have done themselves and for free. So, alternatively, if Alan and Anna had just jumped online to Foz's website and put in their complaint, hmm. they could have. Done they would that. have got the same same outcome. They would have got sixty yeah. days or mm. more while the complaint was being heard, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Um, perhaps mm -hmm. more, maybe less. Um, yeah. And what about this caveat? Why Why would they have lodged, why did helpers lodge a caveat on the title of the property? Uh, well, they want to get their money, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> so essentially what they see is that these people are, have defaulted on their home loan. They may, and, and the sheriff is about to repossess their home, so they may see actually, well, they might not have any money. Um, they might not be able to get a loan. We might not be able to, through this scheme with HomeSaver, actually find a debt consolidation or refinance. Um, so what we're going to do is completely take no risk in this contract, file a caveat, and hopefully get paid out um, by forcing them to remove the caveat and pay us. Or maybe the big bank will actually, when they sell the property through the repossession, will just pay us to get rid of um, yeah. Does that answer your question, Kat? It does. But then that raises the question, what have they done for their $12,000? Oh, I was thinking the same thing. Um, <laughs> so what legal issues do we see? Let, let's move and, and with that is kind of an analysis of what their options are. Um, again, we talk about the Australian consumer law and the legal guarantees. And the thing I meant to raise before is that uh, when this law was enacted, I think it was um, probably our soon to be Prime Minister Bill Shorten who said that the idea is that it gets, it's meant to be to give you what you've paid for these guarantees. So it's to guarantee a level of service. So we would say that this company hasn't provided its services with due care and skill. When I say this company, I mean home savers, the one who said they were going to do the really complicated question about, well, but they haven't done anything wrong because um, they haven't charged any money. So if we talk about helpers, um, have they actually done anything wrong? I mean, they mm. just pot charge four thousand. Sure, you can do it for free, but that, I mean, so what's wrong with that cat? Well, it's pretty noxious, but. They're targeting these services at someone who's in financial difficulty in the first place, and they know that that Anna and Alan have been struggling to pay the mortgage. So charging them four thousand dollars on top is unlikely to actually help them uh, manage. So I think yeah, if we look at the services that they were actually provided, if we provide, if we look at a really broad view of mm -hmm. saving their home, because in the end it didn't. Act actually save their home. That's right, the sheriff came knocking. Yeah. Um, you know, really high standard to reach. It has to be something unethical or something that's um, abhorrent kind of conduct. Um, and it, it really depends on the individual circumstances and um, often the person who's deciding on the case. Um, but here what we'd look at is that there's been a a really, um, to use your words, cat noxious scheme or arrangement which was set up so that um, home saver who are probably in on this whole thing um, could filter um, Alan and Anna through to helpers um, to arrange for this twelve thousand dollar debt um, to be demanded at a later stage. So we might suggest that that entire scheme was unconscionable, so against good conscience. Um, and finally, I think um, the caveat 
the fact that they've lodged a caveat, which I probably should say, let's say they have a right under their contract with Alan and Anna. Um, you could say that that's an unfair contract term because really it's not necessary to protect their legitimate interests. Um, there are, there's plenty of companies out there that don't require you to uh, allow them to lodge a caveat when you enter into an agreement for services with them. Um, so where can they go? Again, I think we reiterate the key points. Um, in our experience with companies like this, they're not members of ombudsman schemes, so the free and informal dispute resolution process is out. Um, highlighting probably the real problem for unrepresented um, people who don't have the help of great financial counsellors and excellent community lawyers. Um, so you'd have to take take issue in a, in a local court or a, um, a tribunal. Um, or perhaps you could take the strategy of trying to have the, the caveat removed, but um, that's probably beyond the scope of, of today. Um, if we move to debt agreements, um, Kat, do you want to talk about, well, maybe I'll give an explanation of, of what a debt agreement is quickly, get stuck into this one. A, a formal arrangement on debts at a normal, and your creditors are bound by them, they can't take any other legal action. Um, usually used to protect an asset that you own um, and if you earn less than a certain amount. So often people who have a, a family car that they own will instead of bankrupting um, their debts because they, they might lose their car um, because it would get taken to pay off their debts, they might enter a debt agreement which would allow them to pay back some of their debts but keep the car. Um, so Kat, you've seen a bit mm. more of this happening recently. Yeah, so there's, a, there's definitely been a sharp increase in the use of debt agreements. And you can see why they're attractive to people. Um, it allows you to pay back some of your debts. A lot of people want to do that. Some people want to do that. Um, it does, the interest does stop if you, you complete your agreement. And you're typically paying back a proportion of your debt, somewhere in the range of 50 to 70%. So it sounds quite good and it's often marketed as a government-backed debt relief or debt consolidation and a way to freeze interest and make one simple repayment. It sounds pretty good. It sounds very good, doesn't it? <laughs> However, what is lost often in the, in the uh, sales tactics is that it is a form of personal insolvency and it has some pretty significant consequences. And much like anybody considering bankruptcy, you want to weigh the pros and the cons and the likely consequences of that action really heavily. And you want to weigh it against your other options. Um, and in this case, with debt agreements, clients often have much better options. So in the case of someone who's maybe lost their job and they've fallen behind um, on their credit card bills and they're worried about making payments on loans, what they really need is a, probably a temporary hardship variation while they're unemployed until they get back on their feet. Conversely, somebody who's maybe, um, you know, really in a kind of a permanent long term financial hardship might want to be considering bankruptcy where they wouldn't have to make any repayments if their income's under a certain threshold. So I guess the short point here is that the debt agreement isn't the only option. So with Lisa, let's have a look at her case study now. Should we get into it? <laughs> <case? laughs> We're going to run out of time, aren't we? Sorry, everyone. <laughs> um, so this is um, not an uncommon scenario. So Lisa, um, she's working, but she's soon to retire. So for the rest of her days, she this, this particular person would um, receive Centrelink because she doesn't have much superannuation. Um, but she owns a car, but it's not worth anything. Um, and for the financial counsellors in the room, you will certainly know that through any court or some assets that you own around the house. Um, so she owes 30 grand um, to uh, under credit cards. And she's pretty worried so she sees an ad on TV that promises that um, Debt Co would stop all the interest and make it easy. Uh, so she calls a, uh, the company and a bloke comes to her house that day. Um, he was there for half an hour and he said, if you pay 1800 bucks, we'll sort this out for you. Um, she says, beauty, that sounds good. Um, they didn't talk to her about any other options. They just said, 
we'll, we'll sort this out. Um, it'll be one easy payment. Um, so there was no technicality involved. Lisa then signs an agreement with them where she had to pay 300 a fortnight towards its fee. Um, and then Debco come back to her and say, we've got this debt agreement here. Yeah. Not knowing much about the law, she says, well, radio, I'll, I'll have a look at this. It says that she paid 21000 to her credit, $8,000 discount almost. But what really puts her off is Debco's fees. And out that, she thought she was only paying $1,800. Um, it was fortnight. So after she's paid her rent and all her other $4 less. But Debco's fee is $300 a fortnight. So this puts her into a deficit already. Um, so she decides, well, this is rubbish. I'm not signing this. Um, I'm going to go and see a financial counsellor. Uh, so she started paying 300 bucks a fortnight. They eventually get her out the documents a couple of months later and she realises that she's been sold a dud deal. You know, what can, does Lisa have any ability to get the money back that she already paid? Well these ones are really technical. So what I want to go back and draw your attention to is probably the key point in debt agreement case. It's actually a form of bankruptcy. So if that form is filled out, the debt agreement proposal, and she signs it and then it's actually the government body um, then that, that actually commits the act of bankruptcy. So that's a bit of a flashpoint there. What does that, uh, that mean, Locke, if she's committed an act of bankruptcy? Well, without getting too technical, it means that um, she either goes ahead with the debt agreement, and it means that for uh, at least six months, any of the could try and bankrupt her. Okay. Serious, there are serious consequences for her there that take the control in this situation out of her hands, essentially. If she wasn't told about that consequence, what would that mean for Lisa? Well, to her verbally here, but one of the documents they need to provide is a one-page text dense document that um, talks about what a, they've misled her but it, it, it's far from clear whether that's her way of getting out of this. Um, well let's say that she hasn't submitted the proposal to mm -hmm. ASA. She's in a much more powerful position She'd succeed with that information, but uh, she for what she wanted. Um, had she known that the fees and also the um, the act of bankruptcy were, were involved, she would probably not have gone ahead. Um, and secondly, did this company actually provide its services with the right level of care and skill needed? So we have a number of reasons. One, they would have talked about other, other options. Um, bankrupted and not had to pay any of her, her debts and kept her car. So there might have been other options like talking to a financial counsellor or just informally negotiating with her the creditors based on her circumstances. Chosen some of those other options or been aware of them, would debt co have to turn any money from those other options? Well, that's a good question. I mean, we would probably say that this is the most profitable option, this debt agreement. I mean, it's nothing, but certainly we would expect that it's best interest, and that can be argued under the consumer guarantees. But it does highlight a real issue about 
a lack of regulation because those obligations are on banks and other so lawyers and that? financial counsellors. That's right. Act properly. Um, that brings us to the end of the uh, the case studies, the real case vultures. And now that you're all experts in them, you'll know that your options are we would normally suggest negotiating. So come to some kind of um, uh, compromise. And whether you use legal arguments or whether you use um, the client's circumstances and compassionate arguments to do that, um, that is what we would always suggest. Industry ombudsman scheme. So we talked about the financial ombudsman, the credit ombudsman. Um, TI, telecommunications industry ombudsman. Sure, yeah. This bunch. The energy and water ombudsman. <laughs> Goes on and uh, Ombuds people. Uh, <laughs> some, some of these companies are members, okay? They're not required to, and this is a real gap in uh, access to justice for everyday people there. Um, otherwise, your client might be left with expensive, costly, uh, unaffordable court and tribunal processes. Um, but certainly we would hope that they could complain to the regulator. And in this case, that's either ASIC, the Australian Cons Securities and Investments Commission, uh, or the ACCC, uh, Australian Competition and Consumer Commission. <laughs> Very good. And in the case of debt agreements, the Australian Financial Security Authority. That'll do. That'll do. What are acronyms? <laughs> Any local fair trading organisation. Of course. Yeah. All right. So the short point is... Yes, there's a big gap in the regulation, but your clients do have some options. They have got some legal claims and they've got some avenues, so it's worth investigating them if you're helping them as a lawyer. And if you're not, then referring your clients to a community lawyer if you see some of these problems. So what needs to change? Well, one of the things we've been arguing for is for the debt management industry to be regulated like any other part of the financial system. Um, uh, we want to see some licensing, we want to see them to be members of ombudsman schemes um, and to meet basic conduct steps in the case studies today and really want to be stepping that out. So these people are really acting as advisors. People go to them, they think that they're going to help, that they're in their corner and that they're giving them really good advice and got their best interests at heart and what we see is that that often doesn't happen and so we need some requirements to make sure anybody giving out advice to somebody with debt or money or credit problems actually is acting properly and has the relevant qualifications to do it. We also want to see some better regulation of debt agreements because they're on the rise. They're really um, misunderstood and missold and they can have some really, um, you know, pretty bad consequences for people. And of course, I'd love to hear from you about any other changes you think that would be helpful. We've got our contact details at the end, so I'd love to hear if you've got any other ideas about what else needs to change. How can you go about it? Um, this is some of the work that we do here and it would be great if you'd love to get involved involved in any of that. Firstly, collecting case study a debt vulture company. Getting a case study and showing that harm can be really powerful. Similarly, what clients store. We know we love to get clients who are willing to do so to record it or to the media. Um, we uh, do some media. We also arrange visits with local members of parliament, often taking in a client so they can talk about their experiences and really get this issue up the political agenda. Complaints to regulators are great. Um, the regulators are on notice about this problem. ASIC took a big um, research report at the beginning of last year that really documented all of the problems that we've discussed today. So they're aware. But what needs to change now is for uh, the government to take some action. So it's really about getting this issue up the agenda. You know, there's a lot of things going on in financial services at the moment. It's a pretty hectic space. And this issue sort of languished at the bottom. So we're trying to change that. Um, so stay in touch. We'll be working on this throughout this year. Um, it would be great to hear from people in other states and territories about what they're seeing and how they can get involved. Um, so please stay in touch with us and if you can assist or you want to get involved, then um, give me a call, send me an email. Okay, so I think we've gotten to the questions section. If anybody's got any questions now, please feel free to send them in via the box or via the uh, hand function. 
Yeah. Yeah, so you can see us. Hello, everyone. I know we've raced through this at breakneck speed. We have been talking about an entire industry, so a lot of the subtleties have unfortunately had to be missed out. Um, if you have any follow-up questions after this session, please feel free to get in touch with us. I'm happy to answer any questions you have now or later. Should we, um, while we wait for all of the questions That's to come right. rushing in, <laughs> we run out of time to respond to, shall we talk about um, one of these debt management companies? So um, we didn't do a case study on those. One of the, sorry, one of the budgeting, budgeting. and money management companies. Mm. So um, these are the companies that will often offer to pay your bills for you mm. and get you saving money and um, stop the phone from ringing. Mm -hmm. So, um, Kat, you've had a case involving this? Yeah. So, I mean, again, like with most of these business models, what they promise to do sounds quite good. Um, you know, who doesn't want debt collection to stop and to have somebody sort of come in and help them with their with their budgeting problems. There's a, there's a number of concerns about these for-profit companies that do this service. Um, one of the issues is they're not really under any proper regulation about how, how they provide that advice and what they do with your money. So let's say I'm putting my bills for me. They're keeping all of the interest on my money that sits there and if they go bust, then they're not held on trust, like money that you, you know, pay to your um, accountant or lawyer to be forwarded on to some other third party. There are also this, definitely some concerns around the kind of budgets that they set up. So we've got a bunch of financial counsellors on the, on the line who would be able to do uh, a proper statement of financial position for a person who needs to work out incomings and outgoings and what they can afford to repay and who they pay when and what their options are. Budgeting service don't have to have any qualifications whatsoever to set up a budget and give you advice on who to pay and when. And so we've seen examples where people have been set up on totally unsuitable budgets. You know, we had a tradie who told the service that they were variable income. You know, someone who had amount that had them committed they were and from there and there were consequences. So once you fall behind, you know, some new creditors can take. So that service not only didn't really help him, but actually made his situation a lot worse. Including Sounds risk like both to me, Kat. It does, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. does it Thanks for a fantastic oh, presentation. One of the questions that's come through. So we've actually run out of time for all the questions.